This poem is called Bees in the Eaves. We write in darkness. We love in alleys. We breathe into beige paper bags. Anything to mollify the confusion. Anything to simplify the math. I am beset, even by rest. And when I close my eyes, the world is still macaronic. I feel for the wolf about to be trapped in the landfill. I feel for the crab about to scamper from the net. I feel for humanity when the brightness of sick knowledge falls from exorbitant air. But remedies abound. There's a remedy for everything, and a remedy for every remedy. In the pastel city. I had never been to the pastel city before, but there I was, walking down the prospect, descending the Gustave Dore underground, stepping on bridges to snap pictures, eating Azerbaijan beef, attending a ballet, a circus, watching the thin prostitutes in stiletto heels, encountering artists on walls and authors on signs, talking to you over pasta and wine, over and over to see soberly whom you had become. Then I had that dream, your dead parents coming to me, greeting me, embracing me, pleased, laughing, their faces alive with smiles. And I felt somehow enfolded, ennobled, and emboldened with happiness. And when I waked, I cried to dream again. This is a poem uh, that's uh, set in India. I had the pleasure to, uh, to be uh, there a couple years ago. And uh, this poem is called Agra Road. Agra is where the uh, Taj Mahal is. Do you seek in the heart-shaped palace the cold telos of love the guide asked us? Everyone nodded yes. I stared out the bus window into the face of a ripe monkey whose owner demanded 40 rupees for any photographs I took. Is there nothing willing to forgive the terror of its cost? Beyond the jade gate, a lotus pillar nods to a braided fort. To enter in this colloquy, you must take off your shoes, and when you do, it is 1653, the year of the diamond moon. Mughals roll the candied land. Alligators bask on the soft edge of the Yamuna. But in the iron sky, the ivory birds are still the birds. Uh, and this one is uh, also said in uh, Agra. Uh, it's called um, Bear Ruined Palace. These halls, these walls, naked sacredness is too much to bear. Not bronze, nor silk, nor bone, nor pearl. The cool embrace of the saffron air. The marble imagination transports the driest soul. Every encounter is a dance. Every secret has its key. Black kites screech in the varnished sky. Rhino hornbills palaver in the trees. The future is bejeweled. The past is unembossed. Um, now, the next poem I'm going to read is called uh, Son of Goya, and I want to read it uh, for Susan Tepper, who was originally scheduled to be on the panel, but uh, unfortunately couldn't be here, and uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to, to be here in her, her place, but uh, I'm sorry Susan couldn't be here. And so I want to read a poem uh, that she was kind enough to uh, interview me about, and it's called uh, Son of Goya, and it's uh, in a number of uh, parts. Part one. My father paints walls. My father paints walls because the daylight is malignant and his eyesight is benign. Because dead trees mock him. Because death's weather courts him. Because time's wife spits through cracks. Two. He has lost all worldly goods, all physical money. Where are the friends to comfort his idleness or cure his fear? The accumulations of humanness choke his breathing, yield no rest. All time is his. He paints his walls. Three. The king has commanded his demise, vowed to make my father wear an axe to scissor his eyes, set fire to his skin, all to scratch enemy's initials on his heart with a pebble and a rag. Four. Because his nails are too short, his strength too weak, his breath too hurried, his bones too frail, his heart unsure to take his hands and paint their face, 
He paints his walls. My father paints walls. Five. On the walls are monsters, cities, men, gods, murderers, pilgrims, a witch, a spy, two rifles, a woman, a dog in the sand. These I see. These he lives. Poor father, housed in a private darkness, alone on another earth. Six. I am not against the darkness. I can learn to live with restraint. But nothing, nothing moves here in the ink, and nothing speaks. Nothing speaks in terror of its voice. Nothing but the oily voice of my father, animate in the darkness, where all things hold their breath. Seven. Last week, I returned home and entered the house of a deaf man, disenfranchised of patrons beyond the vile hearing of the world. I entered the house of Goya, the painter, self-abandoned, deaf to light. I entered the house and saw Goya sitting in misery, swallowed by darkness. And from uh, the father uh, of Goya to, uh, to that uh, son, uh, I'd like to read a poem that's a little bit more autobiographical. And so this one's called Dad in the Red Light. My father is 28 years old. He stopped at a light at Broad and Market. He sees a man in a tan jacket start to cross in front of him. All of a sudden, the man disappears. The light turns green. Confused, my father gets out and walks to the front of his car. He sees a guy face down on the asphalt, his head wedged in front of the passenger wheel. He selected my father as his agent of suicide. I've been held hostage by this story ever since I was told it when I was 14 or so. My dad was trying to teach me the importance of checking things out. Then I saw, all his life, wannabe suicides flip toward him like moths. He saved them all. This one is called Love and How It Gets That Way. And I, I stole the title from uh, Henry Miller, who stole it from Ezra Pound. Uh, uh, not love, but, but money. Uh, love and How It Gets That Way. You were the most beautiful girl in the third grade. My thoughts were restless escapades. My heart was roasted butter. I donned wax wings and flew toward the highest sky I could find. And then, among a score of others, to be invited to your party. We all stood on the lawn behind your house, most of us in wide striped tees, one of us in a bow tie, eyeing that thing in your backyard, that thing you pumped to spin around. And we all took turns, you on one side in a yellow dress, and one after the other of us on the other. And we spun you, spun you. And then that kid in the bow tie got on, got dizzy and vomited. And you looked at him with disgust. And I felt like Adam's apple had just landed in my lap. Uh, this one is called Paradise uh, Island. A man comes out of the waves gasping, panting, stumbles, falls, blind with happiness. The shallow water does what it can to kill him. He's shivering, so I place over him my terry cloth robe, a first anniversary gift from you. A crowd is gathered and drags him from the dying waves toward the awful solace of the sand where he lies, having outswum his drowning, having fallen out of the sea. You look down on this man on the ground. He is moaning thank you into the earth. You did the right thing, you say. I did the right thing, yes, but the robe, the new robe is, your gift is ruined. I ruined it. These thoughts swim in my head. Fifteen years later, not a week goes by that I do not think about the fate of that pale blue robe you gave me to wear on our first anniversary vacation by the green waves. Fifteen years later, not a week goes by that I do not remember the texture, smell, and complexion of the water out of which you and I watched the drowning man emerge. This one is called, uh, When the Translator Disappears, the translation withers and dies. The kidnapping of the translator made big news for a short time, but then the general incomprehensibility of things resumed, and everyone except Lorraine went back to work. 
Lorraine refused to extend the futility of human communication. What was the point, she wanted to know? What was the point of speaking if now that the translator had been kidnapped, no one, no one, could decipher what she or anyone else had to say? Lorraine could not fathom how people could return to work. How was work even possible, she wondered. An iron silence began to oppress her, oppress her as she slept. It crept into her body and she felt herself incapable of raising her arms in greeting or to ward off a blow. She sank deep in the bitterness, dreading the dawn and the sight of neighbors, egregious in their pretense of meaningful speech. She pined for the return of the translator, who became messianic in her eyes. Her dreams became denuded of images, infused only with two lines of invariant dialogue. Come back to me. Can't. Can't you see I've never left? It was the translator speaking. He was holding her in his arms. He was looking at her with the tenderness she so terribly craved. She felt, suddenly, as if for the first time, understood. And she understood perfectly, perfectly, the repressed caress of words that poured from his mouth. This poem is called The Deterioration of My Handwriting. I got a D in handwriting in the third grade. I'm an old man now. That failure continues to haunt me. I saved all the letters from girls who said they loved me. As I look back on them, I can tell the ones I liked by the handwriting alone. When that girl in Princeton Junction drew hearts to dot her eyes, I lost interest immediately. I also hated her loopy cursive. Tiny, precise script in real ink on elegant paper gave me deep pleasure not scent, sealing wax, color, or watermark. As I became a man, I worked on improving my handwriting. Its sloppiness infuriated me. It was too revelatory. I stopped writing letters on pilfered bank deposit slips. I sprung for better pens. I adjusted my thinking to maximize the purity of my hands. The better my handwriting got, the straighter I stood. I filled a thousand avid notebooks. I took a mistress. My handwriting became my immaculate paramour. But recently, I've noticed I can no longer hold a pen with brash panache. My journals have become slapdash embarrassments. I open them to random ugliness. I don't have the solace of the integrity of the handwritten alphabet. Sterile emails and obvious fonts assail me. I don't fall in love anymore. I wish my hands could still carve the cuneiform of beauty on the waxy emptiness of thought but all that's left me. What is left me? The precise boredom of processing, processed keys.